Bin Sports ekranına hoş geldiniz. Özel röportaj köşemizde bu haftanın konu Bobby Dixon. Coach Bobby, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's it's great to catch up, you know, like this. In the start of the season, mm-hmm. I was thinking that I was never going to be able to see one of my favorite players again because, mm-hmm. you know, you retired. Mm-hmm. But here you are. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised a little bit, surprised myself. But, uh, you know, I wanted to see what I can do on this other side. So. Since all you do playing basketball your whole life, mm-hmm. you know, quitting basketball, retiring is not, you know, it, it's never an easy decision for players. So mm-hmm. how was that process like for you? I mean, in the beginning, you know, of course, you know, you have these feelings where you feel like something is big like this is changing in your life. So, of course, you feel a little nervous and anxiety, which is normal. But... Um, After a couple of weeks, I felt I felt good about my decision because, you know, uh, now it's time to, you know, do something else because at the end of the day, you can't play forever. So. Yeah, you were actually at peace with your decision, yeah. I guess, so yes. because you were thinking that your body wouldn't take it anymore. Exactly. How were you feeling at that time? I mean, of course, mentally, you probably think you uh, still can play the competitor in you. But physically, you know, when you get older, <coughs> It's hard to get motivated and it's hard to uh, go through that daily grind. And uh, th- pretty much that was where I was at. I was over that part of, of basketball, being practicing every day, being prepared, doing everything you got to do to perform at a high level. So I was kind of done with that part. Okay. You emptied out your apartment at the end of the season, mm-hmm. I guess. You left and yeah. you were thinking that you will be chilling in Chicago for a mm-hmm. while, yeah. hanging out with your kids. Mm-hmm. But then you got the call from Fenerbahce. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I didn't expect it, you know, but uh, I mean, it was interesting to learn that, you know, the impact that I had here, you know, the impressions that I left, that it was uh, enough to have them consider me for a position like this. So I took it as a positive and, you know, and, and wanted to explore it more. So what about the first talk? You know, that wasn't something that was in your mind for mm-hmm. sure. So how surprised were you with the talk? Who did you talk to at first? Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit more about <coughs> the details. I mean, my first thought, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't I didn't think that was a possibility or I wasn't thinking about that possibility. But um, after I talked to Mauricio, the GM, He had put a couple of things in my head, a couple of thoughts that, you know, he wanted me to think about um, possibly coming here and, you know, being that kind of person uh, as a coaching, you know, developing. But uh, a- after I thought about it, I was like, okay, this could be a possibly new career path. So I was like, okay, I want to explore that and see how, see, see how it can be. Okay, let's uh, talk about the extent of your job over here. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody sees you at the EuroLeague games, at the league games, mm-hmm. and you're on the court side, supporting the team, mm-hmm. being the coach you are, but the extent of the job is not just about the A team mm-hmm. over here. You work with the young guys mm-hmm. in Fenerbahce College and junior team too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, what's the job title over here that you, you're working a lot, don't you? <laughs> I mean, I'm not working like a crazy amount of time, but uh, it's basically like, uh, preparing the younger guys to possibly to become pros, you know, um, to possibly get them to understand what it takes to um, prepare every day for games, how to be a professional, um, the approach you must take to um, elevate in your life, period. You know, it's a mentality and it's a mindset thing. So um, basically just going over that with a lot of guys, you know, showing them different type of uh, ways that they can get better. You know, just just things like that. And uh, with the, as you said, with the A-team, it's more uh, mentoring, uh, little uh, player developing, you know, just just making them understand the Fenerbahce brand. Yeah, how hard is it not to get the ball in your hands and, you know, show that drill or play yourself to the I, players? I mean, it's not it's not so hard for me no more because I'm at peace with, with, uh, without me playing. Like, I don't have that urge to play anymore. Uh, but, I mean, of course, you know, my mentality to compete is still there. So, you know, I just want to pass that on as, as in the best way as possible. Okay. Working with the youth generation is something else, but working mm. with the A team, how different is it for you? I mean, you've been part of this club and this branch so long. Mm. I think it's just organically happening for you, I guess. I mean, it's a natural thing for me because, you know, um, when I was playing, when I was home, you know, I had basketball camps. Um, all the years that I was playing most of the time. 
So I was always in that development and uh, mentoring position. So it, it was kind of easy for me to come back here and, uh, and do the same thing. Yeah, you have always been open about your past mm -hmm. and, you know, because that made you who you are today. Exactly. Definitely. And y I've known about this part. Uh, you have been giving back to the youth in Chicago mm -hmm. just to make sure that kids, mm -hmm. you know, have it better than you maybe. Mm -hmm. How was that like, you know, during your playing career, how much have you been I involved in these kind of activities? I mean, um, since, I, since I've been a professional, I mean, I, I try my best to um, go back to my community and, and, and be like a face, a symbol of hope and possibility. You know, so uh, during the summers, I'm always around those kids, around basketball, or just around just showing them that it's other avenues that you can take than being on the negative side of things. So, I mean, it's just so many things that um, I'm a part of back home as far as uh, a lot of guys, they ask me a lot of different questions. You know, they ask me, um, how can I, how can they get better? Life questions. What should they do in this situation and circumstances? So that I, I love helping people in that way. So, okay, I know about your past, mm -hmm. and most people do. But for those who haven't read your biography, mm -hmm. how would you talk of your childhood? I mean, of course, you know, uh, it wasn't easy. It was always a struggle. You know, I come from a family of uh, hard circumstances. <laughs> I would say, but uh, I mean. I like to think of it as not being a victim, you know, of my past. So I took it as, you know, it built, it built my character, you know, all these struggles, all these obstacles I had to overcome, it, uh, it made me mentally strong. So I'm able to push forward and help other people and get them through things in life as well. So. When did you realize that basketball might be your ticket out to all of the struggles you went through? I mean, I, I always had that in my head. I don't know. No matter the circ situation that I was in, that possibility just stuck in my head. F for what reason, I don't know. Because I'm not a big guy. I don't have this big frame. You know, I don't know. I guess it was always in me to, you know, uh, be a basketball player. And, but then I had to put the action behind it and be super disciplined and make certain decisions to make it happen. And you were arrested at some point mm -hmm. of your... Uh, youth and mm -hmm. you know how were you able to keep playing basketball what was the you know life in prison I mean so that so that situation was like this I was 17 years old and uh, I was in the street basically hanging out with friends you know doing you know things that I had no business doing you know so uh, it caught up to me uh, I went to jail for eight months eight nine months but while I was there, which was my senior year in high school, yeah. by the way. So while I was there, I told myself, how did I put myself in this position? I don't belong here, which was pretty much what everybody was saying. <laughs> Who goes to jail? But uh, so once I was there, I just made a decision that I would never put myself in this position again and uh, made the best of my situation. So once I was there, I was in the boot camp. You know, it was like a military type of jail. Mm -hmm. While I was there, I got my GED, which is the equivalent of a high school diploma, which I would have graduated that year if I was on the outside. So I made the best of my situation. So once I got out, I told myself I'm going to school and see what happens. So, and while I was uh, grinding for a whole year when I got out, I was working a job, crazy job, UPS job. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I had met a met my mentor, Brian McKinney, and he was working me out, sending me through all these type of crazy conditioning and basketball drills. And he just started calling schools and one school picked up and the rest is history. <laughs> when that school picked up, mm -hmm. besides playing basketball, how well of a student were you at college? I mean, in, in, in high school, I would say I didn't really too much apply myself. I was, my mind was on other things in high school, but in college, I, when I started to apply myself, I was pretty good, I was pretty smart. Uh, <laughs> I picked up things quick, you know. I got a great memory, so I mean, in high in college, I had like a three point four GPA. It was, it was simple once I locked in on it. And you studied like four years, right? Yeah. So you majored in. I had a business degree and uh, minored in uh, like physical therapy. 
is this a business degree put to good use? I know you own a barbershop in Chicago, don't you? Yeah, actually, yeah, I do. I own a barbershop, but uh, I, I have. I own like 43 rental properties. So uh, everything that I made, my salaries in basketball, I just put into real estate. So I won't have to work and need money ever again. So. Good. The business That's degree. one of my passions, real estate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the business degree works perfectly then. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you don't really need a business degree to do real estate. Anybody can do it if you, you know, focus on it. Okay. While, you know, growing up in the United States and, you know, going through the struggles you do, you don't realize what's, you know, out there in the world, especially, mm -hmm. you know, basketball-wise in Europe probably. Mm -hmm. So how surprised were you with the basketball level in Europe and... Uh, the life itself actually mm -hmm. I mean so like you said when, when you're growing up in the States and you've never been abroad and you first come it's like a big shock you know um, it's completely opposite of everything you used to in the States but once I seen it in the competition level and see how big basketball is over here I mean you just try to do the best that you can and in uh, and, and the situation that you're in that's how I took it so and uh, coming to Karsheka yeah I mean like uh once I came to Karsheka, that was like, uh, honestly, when I first came, I didn't really want to come to Turkey. Really? I didn't because when I was in Italy, we played Turk Telecom in the Euro Cup game. And then I went to Ankara and I seen the conditions of Ankara then. It was like really scary. I don't know if you know when you're coming from the airport of Ankara, this big, this uh, development that they have is really nice now. But it wasn't like that. It was like a big hole on the side of the expressway and I was on a bus and it seemed like we was going to fall over. So that terrified me in <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> so that's why I didn't want to come when I first seen that. I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? I didn't, uh, I didn't understand what that was. But um, after that, once I came to Karsheka, I, I blended right in. It was completely opposite than what I thought. Who would have thought that Turkey would be your second home? <laughs> exactly. Huh? It's crazy how life works out. From Mavi Shehir to Ate Shehir. Exactly. <laughs> That's been a long way. Yeah. But, you know, that Karsheka team was special for sure. Oh, yeah. And sure. the first year you made it to the Euro Challenge final. The second mm -hmm. year it was a Turkish Cup win. And the third year it was a Turkish League Championship. Walk us through that process. That first year, uh, I mean, how surprising was it to end up in the final of uh, European competition? I mean, the first year I didn't, I didn't expect anything. You know, I'm just coming into a job and, you know, I'm just looking like, okay, we're playing these games. But then I seen we had a possibility to really be good. And uh, once the year started going along and we started winning and winning and winning and we started getting confident and confident and confident, then anything was possible then. So, uh, like you said, once we got to this finals, um, we almost had that final yeah. until somebody threw something on the court took away the momentum and we lost so it was devastating but you know we had a successful year overall yeah yeah and uh, it was a rumor but I'm not sure if uh, if it was true there was some interest uh, for you from Fenerbahce the next year I guess before even winning the Turkish Cup mm -hmm. is it true I think so yeah but uh, it was true but Fener I mean uh, Karsheka was gonna let me leave for sure but I, they didn't never tell me though I heard after the fact huh. so you know I, I never knew then but after the fact, I, I heard about it. I mean, you were the key guy for Karsheka, for sure. Of course. And just you know, not long after, you have won the Turkish Cup, mm -hmm. which was huge for the city. You, you won that Turkish Cup against FS. Yeah. And you won the championship against FS. Mm -hmm. And that championship, uh, I mean, I think but you... even the Turkish Cup that we won, we had to go through... Telecom, which was in their gym. Yeah. <laughs> then we had to go through Fenner. Yes. Then we had to go through FS. And, you know, in those games, especially in the final against FS, mm -hmm. uh, in the Turkish League Championship, there was this rivalry between you, Toma Hertzal, and mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. You always kind of, you know, fed from these kind of situations, right? You like to pick an enemy on the court and play yeah. against them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't so much... Uh, that he was my enemy. It was just the things that he said that, that <laughs> motivated me. So, you know, me playing in this small team, which, you know, they consider small Karshek, and he's playing in that this Euro League power team. And he said something to me that kind of like made me angry. So if you do that, then it's, you're going to see a different Bobby. So <laughs> that's all that was. <laughs> Who else has done that for you in Euro League? Um, 
I would say, you know, I wouldn't say he done anything, but Scotty, yeah. you know him. He, uh, you know, he has this arrogance about him that I really didn't like. So once he did that, then you're gonna see the best. You know, you're gonna always see the best of me. I never took two things too personal, you know, with certain people. Like I always come off respectful until you become disrespectful. When you become disrespectful, then you're gonna see me become really disrespectful. So that's just how I approach life. So. Uh-huh. That Kaseka team winning the championship with them, I think that was the perfect situation for you. That was a really good team and bringing yeah. in Ken Gabriel, DJ Strawberry and John mm-hmm. Dibbler was playing great with you. He was there for three years. Mm-hmm. And how was the pieces? How, you know, how was the atmosphere in the team? That was like the perfect situation. Like that was like glue coming together. Like mm-hmm. me, DJ, John, we all complimented each other. We always complete, all completely different. Me being able to shoot, drive, do everything, run a team. DJ being a great defender, driver, slasher, rebounder, big guard. John being able to shoot the three consistently. Can't leave him open. Hustle guy, defender. Kenny, same thing, shoot the three. Athletic, dunker, crowd exciter. And Juan, strong, big, physical, you know, mid-range shooter. And, you know, it all came together. And once that came together, you know, we start getting this confidence and we start winning games and we start believing. And once that happens, you know, it's hard to stop teams like that. You were there for three years. And before that, you were not longer than a year in any club. Right. So that was a different situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you be able to, you know, even imagine the long time run you had in Fenerbahce? Mm-hmm. Even Karşıyaka was looking so lo- long then. Right. I mean, like, you know, as a as a foreigner, when you come to Europe, you know, you like a mercenary almost. You know, you go to teams and you provide a service and you don't know if you're going to be there the next year. And that's just how it normally is in Europe, you know. But on a bigger team, sometimes it's, you stay a little longer. So um, once I got to Karshek, I didn't know I was going to be there three years. It was like year by year by year basis based on performance, you know, with mm-hmm. most jobs. And even here, when I first came to Fener, you know, I signed for the first two years. Um, by me being Turkish, that was an advantage, you know, so, you know, and then my performance was well, so it was, it was, a, it was like a good marriage, so to say, to stay here. <laughs> Let's talk about you being Turkish. You mm-hmm. first wore the jersey in 2015 Eurobasket, and mm-hmm. I was there following the games, and, you know, you were playing really good. Mm-hmm. What was that experience like for you? I mean, you came to this country, it became your home, and you became a citizen. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was... Honestly, that was like a, a huge stamp that said that like you arrive when a comp- when a country adopts you and asks you to play for their national team. Like as an American, you don't never expect that, you know. But once that happened, I felt the responsibility. Like man, I gotta play well. I gotta represent this country right, this jersey right. I gotta I gotta um, do everything right. So you know. I don't feel like they wasted something on me. I didn't want to be responsible for anything. You know, I wanted to make things better. So that was just basically my mindset. Well, you have changed your name while, uh, you know, getting your Turkish passport mm-hmm. and being called Ali. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how, uh, how different was that for you? I mean, it's not so much uh, that it was different. It was just like, you know, an honor to, you know, be able to change your name in a country adopting that name for you. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, it was it was a good feeling though for me to honor Muhammad Ali. You know that's one of my childhood idols. So it was a, it was a great feeling. The season of Fenerbahce started. You had you know ball handlers alongside of you. New signings too: Kostas mm-hmm. Sulukas, Bogdan Bogdanovic. What was the picture like then? You know you were hearing about all of these signings, and mm-hmm. you know there was lots of expectations of you. Some people think that. You're not your league material, maybe. Mm-hmm. There were lots of, you know, tweets that, that I was reading about. I'm sure you <laughs> followed a few. I know you follow those kind of things on social media, don't you? Uh-huh. No, not really. I like. I'm not a big Twitter guy. I don't really follow that too much. But I mean, you got to understand. People may say like that I'm not your league guy, but then, but come on, like, I just showed you a whole season of work, whole three years of work of what I did on a smaller level team. And how can you, what, if I wasn't Euroly, who was at that time? That was an extra motivation for you. Yeah, like, that's disrespectful. I take things like that personal, and I'm going to prove you wrong every time. That's just how I approach things. I'm glad you proved that wrong. (laughs) And that first year, 
uh, mm. the final four in Berlin. Mm. Th you know, that semi-final game was just so exciting. Yeah. Uh, after beating Laboral, the game started against Ceska and you dug yourself a hole in the first half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, you came out on the stage <laughs> shooting, I don't know how many, five trees all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Walk us through that Final Four experience. I mean, in your first year, it was a whole different picture. I mean, um, that experience was, you know, I, didn't, I don't think I played too much that semifinal game against La Barra. And uh, in the final, you know, we was down 20 at halftime. And, you know, once you get to a final, it's like, dang, we get this far to lose. So once I got the opportunity to play, you know, it was like a panic button that went off in my head. Like, my only thought was to win the game. Like, I was only thinking about winning. So, and all my talent came out. So, you know, it was like a sense of uh, urgency. And that's how I played. And it was just uh, one defensive re rebound shy from you guys. I still have nightmares about that. <laughs> one rebound. The we worst moment rebound. of your career, maybe. For Would sure. you call it that? Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. if we win this game, first year in Fender, we win a final Euro League. That's like huge, you know. So another stamp saying that you arrived. But well, you were working alongside a huge champion like Coach Obradovic, so. Mm -hmm. How, yeah. uh, you know, was this losing process working with him? What kind of words did you hear from him? I mean, he, he was nothing but positive when we lost this game. You know, uh, he understand that, you know, things like that happened. But he understood we fought and we did everything possible to try and win that game. So, I mean, he, he gave us the right, you know, information at that time to, you know, keep going on, season continue. You know, we're going to continue next year and, you know, we're going to be better and learn from it. I was working with Coach Brother, which that was your first year, and it, he was probably a lot different than most of the coaches you have worked with, huh? Of course, because, you know, his intelligence and his basketball IQ was so high. And mine's, I wouldn't say mine's was high, mine's wasn't com nearly as high as, I didn't know what I needed to know that he taught me a lot of things that I thought I knew, but I really didn't. So uh, he was more technical part, the little things, you know, um, it's just like basketball moving in a, a rhythm, you know, as far as like everybody being on the same page defensively and offensively. And, you know, once I got that, I understood him and his passion as a coach. So. Yeah, but he's this hot-headed guy on the bench mm -hmm. who yells, screams, and how was... But it was for a reason, adaptation. though. Yeah. It was for a reason. Like, most times when he says something, he's right. Like, 99.9% .9 of the times he's right. So once he says something, you can't take it too personal. You got to take what he's saying and apply it. If it don't apply, let it fly. If it, it do apply, do what he say. And then most times when you do what he say, it works. Definitely. Yeah. And it worked the next year, exactly. actually. Yeah. you finishing the season without a home court advantage. Mm -hmm. What was the mindset like at that point? Because I've been to that playoff series with you and it was an amazing atmosphere to mm -hmm. be in, but it was tough. It was tough, but you guys were strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because, you know, we got healthy at the right time in the playoffs. You know, I think Bogdan was out, and uh, everybody had experienced the year before when we lost the final. So we were just hoping that we can be healthy. And once we got healthy, we had the first two road games in Panathinaikos. Yeah. And we completely locked in, and we won both those games. So, <laughs> and once we won both those games, we coming back here, we felt completely confident. That final four, yeah. where you won the championship in Istanbul. How sweet was that? The atmosphere over here did not fall short from Oaka too. I mean, that, that experience was crazy. That was like a great feeling. For me personally, it was a big sense of accomplishment. You know, by me coming here and winning the EuroLeague final, first one in Turkish history, that was like, okay, you can rest now. You did something. You actually won something big like this. So it was just like a great feeling. Definitely. And, you know, even though you don't make it to the championship game, you don't win the championship. It's the most important part of this to be consistent and to be in Final Fours mm -hmm. in a row. And you kept doing it too. Mm -hmm. Staying on the top is hard when you win the championship. Yeah, for sure. That's what everybody talks about. So how was the process after? I mean, we went to, what, three straight finals, EuroLeague finals? Yeah. Um, of course, you know, you're used to a standard. And then uh, a 
as you know, everybody's getting older and everybody's starting to get a little bit, you know, restless. That's just how teams get when you've been together for so long. So things, you know, start to change a little bit. You know, the fire isn't there so much anymore. But uh, I mean, you just try to stay on top. But you know, it's not always easy, and you're being hunted by other teams because yeah. you're at the top now. So you turn around and everybody's chasing you. So you gotta always be ready for that. Sometimes. You not so okay. Let's move on to the Coach Bobby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how was working, you know, uh, with the guys that mm -hmm. you have been a teammate with mm -hmm. as a coach? I mean, you know, uh, of course, you still have that humor that you like. Me and Jan, we have a chemistry. Melly, I mean, you know, I play with those guys. You know, we always have that friendship part of it. But I try to be serious sometimes and. Uh, <laughs> And try not to play as much, but my personality is uh, laughing type. I don't know how to be, you know, s okay, I know how to be serious, but sometimes it's hard to be serious around those dudes when you have so much history with them. But, you know, I just try to do, you know, my job and, and try to stay on task, basically. Yeah. I was thinking that you were always the funny guy yeah, in the yeah. locker room, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that it might have been a challenge for yeah, you. Yeah, it is, it is, but... Because that's just my natural position to always find humor and everything. So. Okay. Uh, Jan Veseli is shooting trees now. Mm -hmm. How involved are you with that situation? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a really uh, weird thing to see. He was this guy in 2016 that was not being able to shoot the free throws. Yeah, and yeah. his mid-jumpers right now is a sure thing. And he's shooting trees too. <laughs> I mean, Jan is a really hard worker. You know, he, um, he really locks in on his job. Like, he understands that he got to lead this team. He understands that he's the face of Fenner right now. And, you know, he uh, he works really hard. He comes in every day. But as far as me being the face of that, I'm not the face of that. That's him constantly working on things that he was weak at. So, Yeah, he's a really good example, too. Oh, yeah. He Actually, plays 110% every game. Like, it's never enough. Like, you always got to get better. Every year you try to add something to your game. And he's not consistently shooting threes but he will shoot it you know and he's starting to believe more and more in his shot which is good and how do you think this season is going for you guys because it was a bit of a struggle in the start of it but right now the pieces are falling together mm -hmm. but there are some I mean, injuries at this point of the season yeah I mean like in the beginning guys was losing we was losing games by one and two points I think we lost a total of five games yes. by at least one and two points so it was always something to take away from those games on what we need to do to get better. But uh, I think the guys have now turned the corner on that part of the uh, ending game situations and trying to uh, win games at the end and being really careful with the ball and who has the ball and who making those decisions to make sure that we finish the game in the right way. And uh, now we're doing that. And this was a new team, so it, it, it takes time. So uh, I think the guys is way more comfortable with each other now. But the guys are always fighting, so that's nothing more you can ask for if they're fighting. Hopefully, n the new year will mm -hmm. treat you good, guys, mm -hmm. and you'll be Hopefully. back to the playoffs. Inshallah. <laughs> Any messages for our audience for the new year? I mean, Happy New Year. Uh, wish you all the best for 2022. And uh, hopefully see you guys around in the arena or around Istanbul. Thank you, Bobby. It's always a pleasure <laughs> no to problem. talk to no you. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bobby Dixon, özel röportaj köşemizin bu haftaki konuyuydu. Gelecek hafta yeni bir konukla tekrar karşınızda olacağız. Hoşçakalın.